But if you have a lawyer that doesn't understand the technology, then the CISO is not doing their job. Part of the CISO's job is to explain to the lawyer the technology and the environment in which they're operating. This is a Security Weekly production. Security Weekly is a resource of Cyber Risk Alliance. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is proud to present CISO Stories. Each week, CISO Stories takes a deep dive on security leadership with one of the contributors to my latest book, the best-selling CISO Compass Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, as well as other top CISOs and industry security leaders. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com. I am your host, Todd Fitzgerald, and this week we welcome Mark Rash, General Counsel at Unit 221B and Prosecutor of the First Computer Hacker Case under U.S. federal law. Well, I, I started practicing law for the Justice Department in 1983, and I was doing a lot of different types of cases. I was prosecuting the Gambino crime family on Long Island. I was prosecuting presidential candidate Lyndon LaRouche. I prosecuted a lot of uh, fraud cases and white collar crime cases, as well as street crime cases, misdemeanor street crimes in the District of Columbia. What happened is while I was prosecuting the LaRouche case, which was partially a credit card fraud case, we started to have a number of computer hacker incidents, one at Harvard, one at MIT, uh, one at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories. And uh, one of my best friends was a computer scientist at Harvard University, taught at Harvard, and he ran the Harvard Computer Science Center. And uh, that's where I got my rudimentary knowledge uh, of uh, the TCP IP protocols and of what was at that point called ARPANET or DARPANET. Uh, and the, uh, the attacks were, were uh, related to that. And so I was basically the person at the Justice Department. They said, here, you know something about computers, handle these cases. And over the course of a few months, I started to educate myself literally by going to the Department of Justice's library and then to the Library of Congress, getting books about computer crime, computer hacking, uh, reading the, the Rainbow Series uh, of, uh, of books and trying to educate myself about the nature of computers and computer hacking. So you've been in this quite a while. I mean, you've prosecuted some of our well-known cybersecurity uh, criminals as well, haven't you? Well, the first case I worked on was what was called the Hanover Hackers or the Cuckoo's Egg case. And that was a case involving uh, uh, Clifford Stoll, who was a astrophysicist at, uh, at Harvard, uh, also working with Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories, who discovered some unusual activity on a network uh, that he was responsible for and couldn't get anybody to take it seriously. So he had ultimately uh, tracked back the attacks to uh, East German Stasi uh, officials working with the case KGB trying to break into U.S. government computers to steal information about the so-called Star Wars Strategic Defense Initiative. That was the first computer hacker case I worked on. Uh, after that, there were a number of other ones, uh, in one involving most famously Robert Morris, the Internet Worm case, which was a, uh, a 23-year-old Cornell graduate student who uh, wrote a worm program that was not designed to cause any harm or damage, but it shut down about 10% of the computers on the internet for about anywhere from six hours to a couple of days. Uh, and then there was uh, Kevin Mitnick, uh, a series of different cases with respect to Kevin Mitnick and Kevin Polson. At the same time, I was also doing espionage and counterintelligence investigations and prosecutions too. So the two sort of melded together. Mm -hmm. Well, a fantastic uh, background, and, and you wrote a, a great piece for the uh, CISO Compass book, uh, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers, which you're clearly a pioneer in this space. And you wrote a piece called How to Talk to Your Lawyer. And you started off with a, a quote uh, uh, from uh, Shakespeare uh, uh, about talking about Dick the Butcher. Uh, could you could you expand on that a little bit? Well, there's a famous quote uh, from Shakespeare 
where he says, uh, and I think it's, um, uh, it's not Richard the Fourth, uh, but uh, where he says the first thing that we do, let's kill all the lawyers, and that reflects public animosity about about lawyers and the like. But what's interesting about that quote was uh, these conspirators were talking about what they needed to do in order to cause anarchy to reign within the uh, within the regime, so they could take advantage of the anarchy to overthrow the government. And they said, basically, first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers, because for any system, you need some rules. And for any system of rules, you need people who can make the rules, explain the rules, arbitrate the rules and the like. And that's why lawyers play an important role in cybersecurity. It's not just about regulatory compliance. Uh, it's also about balancing of risks, balancing of harms, understanding who the stakeholders are, and ensuring that uh, everybody up and down the supply chain, and I use that term in quotes, uh, is doing what they're supposed to do. So you mentioned that the, the, the lawyers are sometimes perceived as being the doctor. No. And, and it, it was kind of refreshing to actually read that because for many years, the, the CISOs have been seen as, as the doctor. No. Um, so is that, a, is that a fair representation of the lawyer? It, it is. And a lot of it has to do with how lawyers perceive their roles within an organization. Oftentimes, lawyers, uh, you know, are risk averse. And so what they will tell people is that they cannot do something or that they must do something. And one example of that that I like to use is in the area of HIPAA and HIPAA privacy law and regulation. And HIPAA obviously has both a data privacy. Uh, HIPAA is a health insurance portability uh I always forget the second P, uh, accountability. Privacy, uh, accountability Act. Um, and one of the key things about HIPAA, of course, is that the P in HIPAA is for portability, not privacy. And the whole idea behind HIPAA was to allow for the creation of this thing called an electronic health record that would be portable. And that means that if you get hit by a bus in Minneapolis, you can pull up somebody's medical record from, uh, uh, you know, from, from Dublin, Ohio. And so uh, the idea there is that to make health information portable, we need to wrap privacy and security guidelines around them. The goal here was to improve patient care and treatment and make medical records much more accessible than they would be if they were sitting in a file folder in the basement of, of a hospital somewhere. So port patient portability and patient care was the goal of HIPAA and privacy and data security were necessary in order to achieve that. What's ended up that happening is HIPAA now is perceived as a impediment to delivering healthcare and an impediment to sharing information about patients and to be a privacy law in and of itself, which it is, but it's privacy with the goal of ensuring healthcare. Anytime privacy gets in the way of providing healthcare, healthcare wins over privacy. And that's something that people just don't understand about HIPAA. And the reason why lawyers have such a bad reputation, well-deserved, is that they will often tell people that they are not permitted to do stuff that they actually are allowed to do. It's just that it's too risky. So if you look at HIPAA, for example, uh, if I have HIPAA data that I am allowed to give and I don't give it, generally I have no liability. But if I have data that I'm not allowed to give and I end up giving it, then I have liability. So the idea is it's much easier for me to say no than it is for me to say yes and take on that risk. So, so lawyers also <clears throat> get this rap sometimes that they don't understand the technology and they ask CISOs to do things in a, an impossible short period of time. So why, why does it take so long? Uh, is, is that fair? It is fair, but I think I'm going to put that one on the CISO and not completely, but if you have a lawyer that doesn't understand the technology, then the CISO is not doing their job. Part of the CISO's job is to explain to the lawyer, the technology and the environment in which they're operating. And I'll give you an example, a personal example. Um, so I was working for a large defense contractor 
And one of the big questions was we're processing uh, medical records for the VA. And we had, you know, 20 million VA records or some ungodly high number of that. And the question was, how long did we have to keep the records? And how do we do data anonymization uh, by field? And I'm dealing with our CISO who keeps coming back and saying, well, we can't delete the th- records. We can't do that. We can't do this. And all the things that we, we can't do. All right. Uh, and so at the end of the day, what I had to do is sit down with the CISO and say, look, this is what my concern is. My concern is, is that this database is hacked and they get all of this data. It's much better if the data is encrypted, but if we can't encrypt it, then we need to at least anonymize it. So if the database is stolen, we suffer no actual harm. So if the lawyer can explain what the goal is, rather than saying, we must do this, and sit down with the, with the CISO, the CISO can explain what technology is available to achieve that goal. So they need to be in harmony. So you talk about that the, the lawyer has, you know, that they are looking at objectives and not necessarily uh, rules or, or mandates. They should be if they're smart. One of the problems is there, there are in the law very few things that are absolutes. You absolutely must do this. You absolutely may not do that. Okay. Um, there are some, uh, and there are, there are ones where lawyers need to stand firm and say, you cannot do this. This is illegal. You know, there's an old saying that uh, <clears throat> every, every company has a uh, assistant vice president in charge of going to jail. They just don't know who that is. <laughs> So they're, they're basically, nobody pays me enough to go to jail for them. So there are some absolutes, but most of the things in, in the law are, uh, are relative. You know, if you ask a lawyer whether you can do something, the lawyer is almost always going to tell you it depends. So the idea here is to say within the law and within the regulatory framework, how do we achieve substantial compliance? You're never going to be 100% compliant. And by the way, I don't like to talk about compliance in the law for, for a very good reason. Oftentimes, compliance with the law or compliance with the regulation becomes the objective. Let's do what we need to do to comply with HIPAA. Let's do what we need to do to comply with GLBA. If all you're going to do is comply, okay, if all you're going to try to achieve is compliance, then that's all you're ever going to do. The goal here is to say, how can we reasonably protect the confidentiality, availability, and integrity of the data? while continuing to do what we what our job is in a way that is compliant with the law. The article this podcast is based upon can be viewed in the best-selling cybersecurity leadership book, CISO Compass, Navigating Cybersecurity Leadership Challenges with Insights from Pioneers. So compliance should be a consequence of doing the right thing or a motivator to do the right thing, but should never be the objective. So you state that the that the CISO should should uh, you know look at the things that need to be done, like those compliance things as requirements, and then the the the, the lawyer can be a, a good ally and advocate for the security program. So oftentimes I'll get called into a company and they'll say, you know, uh, uh, it's some some company in uh, in uh, Wisconsin that manufactures widgets. Okay. And they say, you know, what do we need to do? What are we legally required to do? Because those are the kinds of questions you're going to ask a lawyer. And the lawyer will say, okay, what's your physical location? <clears throat> what kind of data are you collecting? What industry are you in? You know, so they'll look at the patchwork quilt of privacy laws and data security laws. And are you a defense contractor? No. Are you a government agency? No. And then they'll come up with a, what these, this company is legally required to do. Uh, but ultimately, one thing the company is legally required to do is protect and preserve the assets of the company for the benefit of the shareholders or investors. And that comes without any law or regulation. It's a fiduciary obligation to protect assets. So what happens is a CISO has something that it wants to do. The CISO wants to, and it may be something that is a security requirement, or it may be it wants to expand into new markets in a secure manner. So it has a mandate. One of the things the CISO working with the lawyer can do is the lawyer can say, this is why what you want to do is actually required by law and why we cannot 
do this new program, this new service without actually uh, embedding the kinds of controls or, or uh, objectives into it. So a lawyer can be hey, helpful in getting a CISO a budget for those things that are legally required to be done. <laughs> Think about building a building and you want to put a, a lawyer comes by and says, you know, code says we have to have a sprinkler system in here. It's one thing for a company to say, I'd like to put a sprinkler system in there. Another one for the lawyer to come in and say, you can't build the building without a sprinkler system. Yeah, much much more powerful statement. So, so today we've had all these different issues with ransomware, with our supply chain, um, and, and we all have or should have contracts with all these other parties. But what sort of things should we be concerned about? Uh, as we go down that path? Well, I think the first thing to, to be worried about is defining what a supply chain is because a supply chain means many different things to many different people. Ordinarily, when we think about a supply chain, we're talking about a supply chain of goods and services. So again, if I manufacture and distribute widgets, okay, it is there are certain component parts of a widget there are, you know, what, whatever. I, I mean, I, it's a made-up term that lawyers use, but there are the component parts that need to go into the manufacture of the widget. There's the hardware needed to build the widget. There's the distribution system to sell the widget out. But the the supply chain also includes my computers, my computer network, my cloud provider, all of the vendors and suppliers who I rely on to make sure that those things are working, all my apps, app developers, uh, operating systems, uh, everything as a service, all of them. And in fact, even my hardware manufacturers for my laptops, desktops, cell phones, manufacturing devices, all of that is part of my supply chain. These are the things I need to have and need to have properly functioning for me to take raw, take some uh, raw material and get it to my plant, make a product, sell the product and get paid for it. So you have to look at what are your dependencies? Who do you rely on? What would you do if this place wasn't uh, up and running? That's your entire supply chain. Now you have to distribute out liabilities or um, uh, responsibilities. So if you have, say, a cloud provider, you have a cloud contract. What happens if you can't get to your cloud data? What is their responsibility for uptime? What are their responsibilities for security? What is their ability to access your data? What is their ability to shut you out of your data? How much time do you have to be logged out of? So you have to, for every contract, where there's a dependency, you have to ask yourself, what are the roles and responsibilities of the two parties? So if your cloud provider is hit by ransomware, what are their duties and obligations to you? What are their duties and obligations to prevent the ransomware? What are their duties and obligations to report a ransomware? What are their duties and obligations to have insurance against harms and losses? What if one of your customers sues you because you can't deliver widgets to them because your cloud provider got hit by ransomware. Your systems are fine. You were never touched. So you have to think about second and third party liability. Those are the types of things lawyers try to do every day. So one of the things that people ask for a lot are things like right to audit and documents of their security controls and how, how often are, are companies successful in getting those sorts of clauses in well, the contracts? They can get them in the contracts. It, it, a lot of that is a power play. Who is the 800-pound gorilla in the contract? If you want to do business with me, you'll agree that I can audit your systems or networks. But let's take the example of a 800-pound gorilla, and they go around and they tell everybody, we need the right to audit everybody's, uh, everybody's security and privacy, their policies and stuff like that. They don't want to do that. That's not their job. They don't want to be in the auditing of, of vendors and suppliers business uh, because the first problem is they don't, what, what ends up happening is it ends up being a self-certification. So a company that's a vendor or supplier, the big 800 pound gorilla will send the requirements out. You need to meet these requirements. You need to self-certify that you've met these requirements. And they do. They self-certify. Why? Because they don't get the contract if they don't. Um, and then something bad happens and there's a lawsuit 
And in the lawsuit, they find out that A, the self-certification was nonsense. B, they didn't have the controls in place that they said they did. Or worse, the self-certification was perfectly appropriate. They did do all the controls. They just weren't appropriate or the right thing for the time or circumstances changed or something like that. So you set up a, a static requirement and they certify once a year, which means for 24 hours, that institution is pretty secure. Mm-hmm. What you can't audit are things like a culture. You can't audit a, a culture of safety, a culture of security, a culture of recognizing problems and addressing them. And the, and the like. So these static audits are helpful, but not sufficient. And they impose a huge amount of overhead on, on the people who are causing it. Because a, a person may have literally 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 different vendors or suppliers. Um, and it's impossible to audit all of them. And it's unnecessary to audit all. So he, a better approach, which we're moving towards, is this concept of a third-party assessment, continuous third-party assessment, and that if I want to be a customer of some 800-pound gorilla, I have to agree to a, a voluntarily agree to a program that will have a continuous assessment of me, and that uh, and, and there's another problem as the as the vendor, I don't want to have to report my security lapses to 200, 500 different customers. Right. It creates an under vulnerability. Right? It creates a vulnerability, you know? And, and so, um, uh, especially ones that are zero days or ones that can't be reasonably abated. Okay. So, uh, the idea here is the litigation system does that automatically. It says, put in the amount of security that is necessary, that is reasonably necessary to prevent reasonably foreseeable harm but it's, it's not a perfect system. Mark, uh, that's great advice. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And what other things would you like to leave our listeners with when they're you know, talking with their lawyer, engaging their lawyer, and sure. using their lawyer to help with the security programs? There, there are a couple of things. The most important thing, I think, is to go beyond mere compliance. Don't, don't make compliance your goal. Second of all, make sure that your lawyers are educated and knowledgeable, not only about cyber and privacy and cybersecurity, but also about your core business. Because it's really easy to get really secure. Unplug everything. The real thing is, how do you run a business while remaining secure? Uh, and number three is... Uh, you know, lots of lawyers, particularly within a general counsel's office, are generalists. That's what they're supposed to do. They One day they deal with an HR problem. The next day it's a commercial lease. The next day it's um, getting regulatory approval to open a facility somewhere. You want to be able to have access to lawyers who are specialists in cybersecurity and data privacy as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, seek out the experts. Uh, use the expertise as you as as you will, uh, and then uh, particularly when there is a breach, uh, find someone who knows how to handle a breach properly. Well, thanks a lot, Mark. Uh, it's always a pleasure talking with you, and um, thanks a lot for your contributions to the industry uh, and to the CISO Compass book. Thank you, Don. Thank you. Visit more CISO Stories podcasts on securityweekly.com, where you will find an index to prior episodes. The Cybersecurity Collaborative is a unique membership community enabling cybersecurity leaders to work together in a trusted environment. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com slash CSC or visit cyberleadersunite.com.